Thank you, Chicago. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. Thank you. You know, my father grew up in Rock Island, Illinois. Yeah. And my brother went to University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. So <laughs> Illinois has been in my family history. And uh, several years ago when I was working uh, with Oprah Winfrey when she was here on the uh, serious radio that she had, I was here quite a bit. So I've spent some time here. And uh, most recently, since I have announced with my uh, friend Jessica Zweig, wherever you are, and so many of your friends, people have been so kind to me. And I am so grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. You know, uh, I have had a 40-year career uh, writing, speaking about religious and spiritual themes at the heart of all the great religious teachings of the world. And when I wanted to run for president, when I wanted to speak specifically as a political candidate, I had, uh, and I do have, uh, as a religious minority myself, a great respect uh, for the fact that we keep our political conversations secular in this country. And this is one of the ways, <clears throat> and it's important because this is one of the ways that we uh, celebrate and honor and show respect uh, for the religious pluralities, the fact that we have many faiths and no faiths in the American electorate, and this should be a place of conversation that is comfortable for everyone. But I'm also very aware that the founders were not meaning to suppress the religious conversation. As a matter of fact, separation of church and state protects the religious conversation. But more than that, I realized that the spiritual conversation, distinctly separate from the religious conversation, is important to our being deeply human. <clears throat> and I saw a quote from John F. Kennedy where he said, we cannot afford to be materially rich and spiritually poor. <clears throat> and I have, over the course of my career, seen uh, things in this country that seem to me places where we were off at some deeper level than just the external, some deeper level than just the mechanistic, transactional way that things unfold. I think that we all feel that. Something is wrong at the heart of things. Something is wrong at the heart of things, and the reason something is wrong at the heart of things is because we've pushed the heart out. <clears throat> and one of the ways that we have pushed the heart out is that we have allowed an economic system to become God. We have allowed, <clears throat> we have allowed trickle-down economics, neoliberal economics, hyper-capitalism, vulture capitalism, crony capitalism, I don't really care what you call it, but it is a soulless, amoral economic system that has gotten a grip on American society. It has its tentacles in every corner of American civilization. It basically owns our government at this point. People's lives are falling apart because of it. The planet is damaged because of it. Our children are poisoned because of it. And at this point, we the people better step in. I came across a quote from the French existential philosopher Albert Camus. It is from The Plague. It's one of his more famous quotes. He said, in the midst of winter, I found there is within me an invincible summer. And when I read that, I thought, that's it. That's a way to say in secular terms that there is within us something that will take us through these times. Because everything that I just said to you about uh, the fact that we have financialized everything in this country, this started about 40 years ago, a little bit more than 40 years ago, with this trickle-down economic canard. It was basically this wool thrown over people's eyes. And the American people sold on the idea that if you just move all the money into the hands of a very few people, the stockholders and the CEO class, that somehow this would be good for them. Because see, what would happen is that all that money would, they'd become these like corporate, they're these corporate aristocrats, it's like on Mount Olympus somewhere. And these people would be job creators. And then they, jo they, they drop jobs down from their corporate Mount Olympus. You can have a job, you can have a job. And then what it would do is there would be so many jobs created that it would lift all boats. So they would trickle down, this, their wealth would trickle down, it would lift all boats. 40 years later, it is very clear that not only 
Did that system not lift all boats? It has left millions and millions of people without a life vest. This situation, <clears throat> 70% of Americans report that they live with chronic economic stress. 60% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. 64% of Americans saying that they could not afford to absorb an unexpected $400 expenditure. One in four Americans living with medical debt. Tens of millions of people living with thousands and thousands of dollars of college debt. Half of our seniors living on $25,000 and less a year. One third of our workers living on less than $15 an hour when that's nowhere near a living wage in any major city in the United States, and they cannot find a place to live. And you're going to run for president in 2024 and tell us that things are really good. Let's just go in there and finish the job. <laughs> Anybody who thinks that that's the way to beat the fascists in 2024, I disagree with them. I disagree with them. <clears throat> Franklin Roosevelt told us how to beat the fascists. He said, you won't have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country as long as democracy delivers on its promises. That's the problem. De democracy is not now delivering on its promises. Let me tell you something. If democracy was delivering on its promises, we would have the same things they have in every other advanced democracy, such as <laughs> universal health care, like in every other advanced democracy. Free college tuition at public colleges and universities, which we had, which we had until the 1960s and 70s. We would have childcare, we would have paid family leave. We would have, we would have a dignified, decent living wage. We would have guaranteed sick pay. These are moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. These are not fringe lefty positions. These are, these are moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. And the fact that we don't have those things, it's not complicated. I know that's what they want you to think. It's just so complicated. It is not complicated. I'm here to tell you, it's so fucking corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. Let's just get that. Let's get that. This is just a corrupt situation. Now, this is the thing. This corruption is now infused into the way our, our uh, government works. Our, our government has become, for the most part, a system of legalized bribery, particularly since the Citizens United case, the ability of corporate interests to just their undue influence on our political system is so great that at this point, legislator after legislator after legislator does more to serve the profit maximization goals of its corporate donors than, uh, than the will of their own constituents. So at this point, short-term profits for huge multi-billion dollar companies is placed before the safety and the health and the well-being of the American people. This is why there is rationing of insulin in the United States. This is why people are putting GoFundMe pages on the internet in the effort to pay for a life-saving operation. This is why people are working at jobs they hate, but it's the only place, you know, they figure, well, this way at least I can get my benefits, and this way maybe I'll have the opportunity to pay off the college loan debt, even though my college loan was taken out so I could learn that kind of thing, but I can't work over there because if I work over there, I'll never pay out my college loan debt, so I'm going to work over here even though I hate this job. I'll try to do it. Maybe I'll have to work too so I could pay this loan for an education they'll never be able to use. The despair in this country, the chronic anxiety in this country, and then they ask, where does this mental health crisis come from? <laughs> shocking, shocking, can't even imagine. A politician once said to me, a politician once said to me, Ms. Williamson, what do you think we ought to do about this mental health crisis? And I remember what I said to her, I said, I have an idea, stop driving everybody crazy. <laughs> But I realize that you are saying yay because I'm not saying anything you don't already know. But there's something else that I know you already know. They're very serious and they have the system locked up. And if you only look at this from a material plane, we are really in trouble. You even have a president saying he's the climate president. He recognizes the climate as the existential crisis of our time. And he puts some healthy green investments in the Inflation Reduction Act. And then with the other hand, he gives more oil permits even than Trump did and has, and has okayed the Willow Project, which is an $8 billion ConocoPhillips oil drilling project on the north slope of Atlanta. What that meant, Alaska, I said Atlantis. <clears throat> 
So what that means is that even the politicians who say the right things too often disappoint us. And what I have learned is that that status quo will not disrupt itself. It won't disrupt itself. It's not going to do it. If that system is going to be disrupted, it's because we, the people, disrupt it. <clears throat> now, what they would tell you is that only someone whose career has been entrenched for decades in the car that drove us into this ditch should possibly be considered qualified to lead us out of this ditch. <laughs> So what they're really saying is that in order to be qualified to be president or any other member of their club, you have to know how to perpetuate the system as it is. I'm not here because I know how to perpetuate the system. I'm here because I think I'm a little bit qualified to disrupt that system, and that's what we need. <laughs> now, they won't have any of that, of course, because it's a big political industrial uh, media complex political media industrial complex. It's like a, a huge multi-billion dollar industry. That's actually what it has become. Now, having said all that, we know what the problem is. It's a serious problem. It's a serious problem. As Louis Brandeis, the late Supreme Court uh, Justice said, you can have large amounts of money concentrated in the hands of a few, or you can have democracy. You cannot have both. This is a very serious problem. Now that we've covered the problem, let's talk about the solution. They say that in AA all the time, get into the solution. And this goes back to the line from Albert Camus, that in the midst of winter, I found within me an invincible summer. I want to talk for a moment about what happened on July 4, 1776. In 1776, some very brave men signed the Declaration of Independence. And by so doing, the reason I said they were brave is that by so doing, they were risking their lives. If, in fact, uh, the British had won the war, all of them would have been executed as traitors to the King of England. And with the signing of the Declaration, they established within the core of a nation our mission statement. And our mission statement is based on the most radically enlightened principles that had ever formed the core of a nation. That all men are created equal. Not just the king, not just the aristocracy, but that all men are created equal, and that all men have the rights given by their creator to life and to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That was radical in 1776, and it's radical today. And then it goes on to say, this mission statement of ours, it goes on to say that it is that governments are instituted to secure those rights, that that's the purpose of government to secure our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then it actually goes on to say that if the government is not doing its job, it is the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Yeah. <clears throat> now, that was where it all started. And God knows it started on that incredible high note. But it's also where it got very gnarly, and we know that as well. For 41 of the 56 signers were themselves slave owners. So from the very beginning, it is baked into the cake. It is a facet of American consciousness. We are both and. We are, on one hand, a nation which is founded on the most enlightened principles, and at the same time, we have always had, from the very beginning, in every generation, and tonight we're here to talk about the fact, even in ours, there have been people who for their own ideological and or financial purposes had no intention whatsoever of seeing those principles made manifest, had proven that they would go to extreme lengths, even the most violent and the most damaging, in order to make sure that those principles were in fact not made real. Now, that's where it starts. That's our story. Every generation lives out its own iteration of the story. But now look at the larger trajectory of our history. Don't just look at the problems. Identify with the problem solvers. Yeah, we had slavery in this country, and then we had abolition. Yes, we had institutional suppression of women, and then we had the women's suffrage movement. Yes, we had the overreach of capital from the first gilded age, and then we had the rise of organized labor. Yes, we had segregation in the American South, and then we had the Civil Rights Movement, the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and the desegregation of the American South. In other words, we do tend to course correct. As Winston Churchill said, 
you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they have exhausted every other option. <laughs> so my message to you is that it is simply our turn now. It is simply our turn now. <clears throat> you know, I remember, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember the assassinations of the Kennedys and Dr. King, and usually, with every year that passes after the death of someone that you loved or admired, it's a little bit easier. But I know I speak for many, many people in saying that the anniversary of their deaths has never gotten easier through the years. In fact, it's gotten harder through the years because everything we feared would happen has happened. On the other hand, it also occurred to me more recently in the last few years that even if they had lived, they would be very old men now. Even if they had lived, it would be time for us to say, Martin, John, Bobby, you rest. We'll take it from here. It is time. It is time for us to become the people. But in order to become the people, notice I didn't say it is time for us to do the things. First of all, we have to become the people to even know what it is we need to do in order to be able to do it. And that's why we are in a 21st century impulse. Every, every century has its own mindset. The mindset of the 20th century is different than the mindset of the 21st. The mindset of the, 21st, of the 20th century was very mechanistic. It was Newtonian physics. The world is a big machine. And if something's not working in the world, you just tweak the machine. And transactional politics is a, a, a legacy of that. But this is the 21st century. It's a far more holistic and whole person mindset. You see this in young people today, they don't, who, among other things, don't know why they should have to live their lives at the effect of bad economic ideas left over from the 20th. There was a British physicist named James Jeans who said that it turns out that the world is not one big machine. It turns out that the world is one big thought. The mindset of the 20th century did not give primacy to consciousness. The mindset of the 21st starts with the idea that everything out there is a reflection of what's in here. So what's in here that's so damaging about neoliberal economics, what's so damaging about trickle-down economics, is that it has no soul is that it puts profit-making before all else. It does not recognize any stakeholders but stockholders. Whatever makes money for the stockholders, even if it's at the expense of the people, at the expense of our health, at the expense of our children, at the expense of our safety, at the expense of our, to the point that we are six inches from the cliff. We are six inches from the cliff from the state of our democracy, and we're six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of our environment. And for the majority of American people, they're six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of the economics by which they live time after time, year after year, in a sense of survival mode. America's going down. We need to lift it up. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, other generations did it, and I'm sure that they had some desperate days. I don't want to hear one more person tell me the whole thing is just so traumatizing. You think the people who walked across the bridge at Selma were not traumatized? Do you, think that they, do you think that the women who marched, they were thrown in prison, what was, their, what was their crime? They marched for suffrage because they were beaten regularly by their husbands, and they thought maybe if we could get the right to vote, we could do something for ourselves. And so they march for the right to vote. And for, for that, they were thrown into prison. And the conditions in the prison cells were so horrifying that they went on a hunger strike. And the response of the men who represented the prison administration was to send men into their cells and put these metal contraptions around their necks and force feed them. Gee! You think they were anxious, maybe? Enough with the fact that we were anxious. We were anxious until this moment when we woke up. Enough with the fact that we were traumatized. Yeah, you can be traumatized part of the day and then go kick ass and save your country. <laughs> we need to honor our ancestors here. Each and every one of us, I don't care what your ethnic group, I don't care what your religion, I don't care what your culture, you look back far enough, 
your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, somebody had it a lot tougher than we have it today. You look at people in other parts of the world, they have it no matter what we're complaining about. We have allowed the system to make us soft. We have allowed the system to numb us. We have allowed the system to vi make us feel. It's not just so much that it has victimized us, it has double victimized us by convincing us we're victims. And now we have to mark a beginning of a new phase of our history. That's what the abolitionists did. They said, we will end one phase and begin another. That is what the women's suffragists did. They said, we are now going to end one phase and begin another. That's what the, labor, the establishment of organized labor did. We are going to end one phase and begin another. That's what the civil rights movement did. They said, we are going to end one phase and begin another. And that's what you and I can do. And I'm asking that you consider voting for me for president, because I think I can really contribute to the process. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, the system, as I said before, everything that I, that I stand for agenda-wise, I stand for an economic new beginning. I stand for the fact that, you know, right now we have 20% of Americans who have an easy time an easy enough time uh, financially, and that's great. However, 20% <laughs> is not nearly enough. Uh, when you have 80% of Americans who represent a vast sea of economic despair, it's not enough that 20% of us are doing okay. We need an economic U-turn. We're headed for the iceberg here, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else. We need to turn around. And no, it's not enough, an incremental approach. All that an incremental approach, such as President Biden's represents, is, means that we would still hit the iceberg, but we would hit it at a different angle. Okay, so you've got one major party that represents, in my opinion, a nosedive for our democracy. And you have another major party, which is led by the corporatists in that party, and they represent a managed decline. It'll take a little longer. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have any time left. We don't have any time left. We cannot say, oh, okay, they know what they're doing, because clearly, no, they don't. Okay, and for those who say, we got this. No, they don't got this. But I'll tell you what does got this, that invincible summer within us. As I said before, surely the, the abolitionists had desperate days. And surely the women suffragists had desperate days. And surely the labor, the original organized, uh, uh, labor organizers had desperate days. And certainly the civil rights movement workers had, had desperate days. This is a difficult moment. And we need to be adult enough to stand up in the midst of this difficult moment and to admit we are the grown-ups here. We are the grown-ups here. We are not children. We are not immature. And, you know, Gina was talking before about the issues of personal transformation. The issues of personal transformation are the same as the issues uh, that prevail within the life of a nation that seeks to transform itself. Because all that a nation is is a group of people. You have to stand in possibility. There was no, no reason for the abolitionists to believe that they could pull that off. There was no reason for the women who were uh, women suffragists to believe that they could pull that off. There was no reason for the labor organizers to think that they could pull that off. There was no reason for the civil rights workers to think that they could pull it off. They didn't do it based on whether or not they thought it was possible. They did it because they knew it was the right thing and they weren't gonna die knowing that they had been fooled. They figured they figured that they were going to give it that shot in their lifetime, and they prevailed. Why? Because they found within themselves the invincible summer. Why? Because the moral arc of the universe does bend towards justice. Why? Because we are living in revolutionary times. And the system as it is is trying to keep a lid on it. But that revolutionary rumble is under there. The system and the times in which we are living are unsustainable. We're idling on neutral and it cannot continue like this. It's going to go in one direction or the other. It's going to go in the direction of greater democracy, a season of repair, regeneration, and injustice such as we have never seen in our country, or it's going to fall in the direction of dystopia and neo-authoritarianism. This is nothing short of saving our country. And so, and so, as, Mar as uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, he said, the main job of the presidency, he said, is not administrative. He said the main job of the presidency is moral leadership.
You know, as I said to you, as, we, as I said to you before, you know, everybody, you know, that, that crowd, that, and some of whom are nice people. This isn't about nice people versus not nice people. This is about systems. But that system would say, as I said to you before, only people qualified to lead us out of the ditch or those who drove, are part of a system that drove us into it. But they would also say that you have to know the practical matters. You have to know how to drive the car. I would say to you, Washington has plenty of good political car mechanics. That's not the problem. The problem is we are on the wrong road. So, you know, the political car mechanics you can get, they're kind of everywhere. That's not the issue. The issue is not that we need more technocrats in Washington. The issue is that we need a vision in Washington. We need a vision of moral repair, as Gina was saying. We need the vision that actually takes us back to our initial vision, our mission statement, which is the Declaration of Independence. That is our mission statement. That is our North Star. And when we follow it, this country does pretty well. And when we deviate from it, we falter. Now, in terms of the presidency, the Constitution says that the president had to have been born here, the president had to be 35 years old or older, and the president had to have lived here for 14 years. Check, check, check on me. <laughs> but I want to I wanna point out to you what it does not say. It does not say, and this person had to have been a legislator. This person had to have been a lawyer. This person had to have been a governor. This person had to have been a senator. That's just their way of saying it has to be that, meaning they have to be in that club. I think one of my qualifications is I haven't been. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I have been in the rooms where they make their decisions, and you know what? It's no different than the rooms that you and I are in. There's this kind of Wizard of Oz, you know? Oh, it's a Wizard of Oz. Would you know how to be a wizard of the Wizard of Oz? No, but I know how to tear down the curtain. It, 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 it truly is on a certain level, it's simply a, as simple as laying out a vision for this country. Because the vision for this country that is aligned with the Declaration of Independence, the gap, the, the dangerous gap that exists now between the principles on which we purport to stand and the, public, the consolation of public policies in our country, somebody's got to name it. You know, I read an article about myself years ago talking about other aspects of my career, and it was saying, you know, Mary Ann Williamson doesn't say anything that everybody else doesn't say. She just says it when the mic is on. And I laughed when I read that. I thought it was true, and I think it's true now. I'm not saying anything tonight you don't already know. I'm just saying it when the mic is on. I'm saying it when the lights are on. I'm saying it as a presidential candidate. I'm not saying it because... There's a conspiracy not to say it. Oh, we're not supposed to actually say what we know to be true. And this has messed with people's minds. This has gaslit us all. That you, you, you know, you're not supposed to see what in fact you do see. You're supposed to see what in fact you don't see. And it's made all of us kind of, kind of doubt ourselves. Like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, 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 I don't see it. Maybe I do see it. You know, I heard Senator Mark Kelly talk once. Mark Kelly, who was a governor from Arizona, excuse me, senator from Arizona, you know, had been an, uh, an astronaut. And the, the, some of you remember, some of you don't, the Challenger disaster, which was a very um, uh, tragic, tragic incident and all these wonderful uh, astronauts were lost. And it had to do, those of you who do remember, with the O-rings, remember? So Senator Mark Kelly, at the time, uh, astronaut Mark Kelly, was on the uh, committee trying to discover what went wrong, how did this happen? And this is what he found out. What they found out was that there were all these people who were in junior positions who kept saying, don't you, you know, doesn't this seem to you something funky with the O-rings? And everybody was saying it, and everybody was talking about it among themselves. But the higher you got up in the system, the more people were under pressure, we got to get this thing going, we got to get things going, and they demonized the one higher position person that did say, we got to talk about these O-rings. In other words, everyone knew. Everyone knew, but they were scared to speak because I don't know, those people know more about this. And that's what's happened in this country. There's the myth of the experts. And at this point, the idea of a political class a political class, a political class that knows more than we do, uh -uh, that's not what this country was supposed to be. The, Jefferson said the only safe repository of, of power in this country is in the hands of the people. Yeah. Hands of the people. 
And one of the things, when people have asked me, what was it like running for president before? And I can assure you that the same true now. I saw last time and I see now. The system, the political, media, industrial complex that I mentioned to you is even more vicious than I thought it was. Even more vicious than I feared. But you know what? True now, true four years ago, the people are even more wonderful than I would have hoped. <laughs> the problem. The problem is not with the American people. Even if you look poll after poll, do you know the majority of Americans, Democrats and Republicans, want universal health care? Do you know the majority of Americans, Democrats and Republicans, want free tuition? And by the way, when we say free, that means your tax dollars. It's not free. It's your tax dollars paying for it. College, but at, at public universities. Do you know that uh, the majority of Americans, even gun owners, want more common sense gun safety law? The majority of Americans, the majority of Americans, Democrats and Republicans, want us to change on some level, even if they don't want to go all the way. They want climate change mitigation, but I'll tell you what I want. We need a just transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy, and we need it now. We need it now. This is not the time. This is not the time to be ramping up fossil fuel extraction. This is time to ramp it down fossil fuel extraction. This is a, and the American people know what's up. The American people know that an $858 billion defense budget does not equate, the, the gargantuan number of our defense budget does not equate with greater national security. The wars that we have fought didn't make us more safe. The wars in Iraq, the 20, last 20 years in Afghanistan, they didn't make us safe. They squandered our moral authority. They squandered our military respect. The American people know this. The problem is not that the American people don't know it. The problem is not that the American people don't know that we need to change from a war economy to a, to a peace economy. People are all for the right things. The problem is that we currently have a political system which actually thwarts rather than facilitates the will of the people, which has more to suppress the will of the people. We got a problem. There's only one thing we can do. Override it at the ballot box. I can help. It's not really more complicated than that. Some people say, well, Ms. Williamson, what are you going to do about the fact that it's going to be very difficult with Congress? Yes, it is. The president does not have a magic wand. And the president should not have a magic wand. We have three co-equal branches of government, although someone should tell the Supreme Court that. Because... <laughs> and if I'm president, I'm going to tell them, but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> The president, no matter who the president is, is hoping for a political party that is their party to be in control of the House and control of the Senate. Of course, everything I'm saying that I want, the economic U-turn, the economic new beginning of this country, I couldn't go into the White House and just get it by fiat or magic wand. But I'll tell you this, you'd know that I was trying. You would feel viscerally the beginning. You would feel the beginning of the turn. And let me tell you something. We haven't had a radically truth-telling President, much less Democratic president, since Ronald, since, oh God, since, <laughs> since Franklin Roosevelt. Now, when Franklin Roosevelt said what he wanted in this country, and I think of myself as a Roosevelt Democrat, of course they came after him. The same forces that would come after me, the corporate aristocrats, he called them economic royalists. Of course they came at him vehemently, and of course they came after me vehemently. Of course they called him a socialist, just like they called me a socialist. Of course they threw all that stuff at him, just like they threw all that stuff at me. But I would say what he said, I welcome their hatred. And I'm saying to you, I will be glad to watch them squirm. Now, this is what I see. If I become president, and the choice is yours, that's, that's the thing that's so profound here. I can't control who votes for me or wants to support me in this campaign. What I can control is whether you have the option of what I see as the economic new beginning that will close the gap between this constellation of corporate, uh, corporate aristocracy and our own mission statement. At the Battle of Gettysburg, when Abraham Lincoln said that the men who died there for the Union, he said, died, gave, he said they gave their last full measure of devotion so that a government of the people, by the people and for the people, would not perish from the earth. Why are we here tonight? Because it's perishing now. It's perishing now. We have become a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. <clears throat> and then you have a president who says it. Pre president Roosevelt said that there are four freedoms. Freedoms of and freedom from. 
freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom from want, and freedom from fear. President uh, Roosevelt said, a necessitous man is not a free man. One quarter of all girls in Chicago's public schools are deemed to that they would be diagnosed with PTSD. And I also want to point out to you that that's not post-traumatic stress, that's present traumatic stress. They are triggered every single day. And I want to point out to you, you think we have a, a, uh, a, um, a mental health crisis now, what are we going to have 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when you have a generation that grows up having prayed while they were little children every single day that they would not get shot at school that day. No, no, no. We need somebody who says it. Now, the Republican Party is going to tell you things are far, far worse than they are about things that actually aren't even issues. The Democratic Party is going to tell you things are somehow better than they are. Let me tell you what I tell you and what I would tell you if I'm your president. We've got some real problems, but we're going to handle them because we're Americans. That's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> And it's not going to be fast. And it's not going to be fast. We got a big ship headed towards the iceberg, and we got to turn this thing around. And I'm not saying it could all be turned around in four years, but I'm telling you, you'd have a visceral experience. She's, oh, she's starting to turn this thing around. She's starting to turn this thing around. Did you say that? Did you see that person that she appointed to the EPA? Did you see that person? I don't see a corporate industry leader in there anywhere. Did you see? Oh my goodness. Oh my God. Oh my God. Did you see what she actually said out loud at the State of the Union message? Did you see that executive order that she did? You know what's happening right now? There's not one problem in this country, whether it has criminal justice, racial justice, uh, our agriculture, our environment, our business, not one thing wrong with America, that we don't have the geniuses who know how to solve. We have the geniuses, we have the best practices, but this is the problem. The people who have the solutions don't have the power. And too many people in power don't even want to hear from the people who have the solutions because they don't encourage their corporate profits. They don't increase their corporate donors. But if I'm president, this is how I see it. I open the door to the Oval Office and I say to all those geniuses out there who have no power, come in! We got it for four years! We got it for four years! Come on in! We gotta go fast! <laughs> and then I feel like I could kind of give a chiropractic adjustment a little bit get the government to have its heart back and help the American people, to be honest, get our spine back. And then, give me four years, let me do that, hand it over to a younger person, I'm gonna go off, be a grandmother, do whatever I want for the rest of my life, and you'll know. But you'll know, you'll look at each other and say, damn, she was here, I will be. God bless you, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.